Okay. Today is November 19th, 2014, and we are interviewing Joe Ketters at the Adams County Courthouse in Quincy, Illinois. Uh, Mr. Ketters is 69 years old, having been born on September 18th, 1945. My name is Emily Shereen Jones, and I'll be the interviewer. Uh, Mr. Ketters, can you tell me where you were born? I was born in Adams County in Quincy. Okay. And, and uh, who were who were your parents? Richard and Genevieve Ketters. And what did they do? Uh, my dad was uh, a machinist for uh, uh, Electric Wheel in Gardner, Denver, and uh, he also worked for Peer Peerless Pump, which used to make the ducks. Okay. I think we left off where uh, you were telling me about what your father did. Uh, he was a machinist for Gardner Denver, uh, Electric Wheel, and Peerless Pump. They made the, the ducks that, in World War II, the, the landing craft, and they went out of business. And uh, so then he went on to work for Gardner's and Electric Wheel. My mother was a uh, stay-at-home mom, but uh, she worked... Uh, part-time at QU. Uh, she was in charge of all the women helped to clean the dorms in, during the summertime. I see. Uh, did you have uh, siblings? I had uh, three brothers. Yeah, three brothers and a sister. Sisters the oldest. And what did they do? Uh, Joni, she worked for uh, Washington Theater, and she met met her husband there, and they got married, and she went down to uh, East St. Louis, still worked with in the theater business, and uh, then they came back to Quincy, and uh, uh, she was a stay-at-home mom. And Tom, he worked for Buter's Bakery, and, and uh, Bernie Weller at the uh, Ice Cream Place, and uh, um, Jack, he worked for the city, the state of Illinois, highway department, and uh, then he worked 33 years for Napai Manufacturing. And Dick, he was uh, worked for United Rental, and he was a member of the 126 too. And uh, then after we come back from Vietnam, he, uh, he went into the construction business. He was a carpenter. So. Other than your brother Dick, did any of your other siblings serve in the uh, Yes, military? but they never were deployed. Jack and Tom both did. And where were they? What service? Leonard Wood and uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, and uh, that's about all I can remember, you know, because I was a young, I'm the youngest, so. What were you doing before you entered the service? I was an automotive parts salesman. I worked for Turner Auto Supply here in Quincy, and I was a uh, route sales salesman. We went to Barry and Pittsfield and Mount Sterling, and you know, just covered an area like that. So that's what I was doing. Which branch of the military did you serve? Uh, we were called up from the National Guard, but uh, we were attached to the Marical Division in the Army. What was the highest rank you achieved? Specialist fourth class. So how does it work when you are part of the uh, Guard? Did you enlist in the Guard? Yes. And that's how that works? Okay. So you weren't drafted? No. Did you go to training camp of any sort? Yeah, I took basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and uh, took AIT at Fort Leonard Wood, too. What's AIT? Uh, it's like on job training. You know, to, we was quartermaster, so it's issuing stuff, so you know, do all the paperwork and stuff like that. So. Can you tell me a little bit about your experience in training? Well, I kind of, when I uh, went to Leonard Wood, I went down there with four other guys from the same unit. So we went through basic uh, 
together, you might say. Then we got traded, you know, transferred out to different units at Leonard Wood, and uh, uh, we got to be very, very close, you know, and, and that's, uh, uh, I had a supply sergeant there that I worked for. He knew I was from Quincy, and uh, he, uh, he would say, are, are you going home on a Friday? Friday morning, are you going home? And I said, well, I was planning on it, but, you know, we get off work. He says, bye. So uh -huh. so we got out, a lot of times we got out of there at 9, 10 o'clock, and we were home, you know, a couple hours, a couple, three hours. So I had a real good uh, teacher down there, so. That uh, was going to be my next question, whether you recalled any of your instructors and what they were like. It sounds yeah, like they were pretty uh, friendly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had uh, my drill sergeant in basic was uh, uh, Mexican. Rodriguez was his name, and uh, he uh, he was pretty good. Going. But I had a second lieutenant that was from Quincy, Illinois. He wasn't very, very nice at all. Oh, I don't suppose you want to say who that was. No. <laughs> How did you adapt to military life? How, how did living in the barracks and eating the food and socializing, how was that different for you? Well, I had, growing up, I was in the same room with three three boys in the same room. So, you know, kind of kind of used to it. So uh, it it wasn't no real big deal. It was the big, worst part of it is getting up 4.30 in the morning to get, you know, Get ready for what you had to do that day. Uh, you said your job involved being a quartermaster? Yeah, I was quartermaster. I issued uh, supplies like a, a company would come in and say they needed 10 pair of boots to replace the, the boots that the guys wore, all, wore out. And uh, I would go back and get the 10 boots and, you know, they had a rep requisition and uh, I would get the 10 boots and sign a requisition and keep file at. And, uh, there was three three other guys that did that, so the guys wouldn't, so the other companies wouldn't have to sit around. So I'd like to ask you about your wartime service. Tell me where you served. I uh, served in Chulai, Chul South Vietnam, and it, it was right on the uh, China Sea. So uh, we had uh, a company area, and most of the guys in the guard unit were established in trades. And we had carpenters, we had refrigerator repairmen, uh, we had electricians, uh, you know, they, they pretty well knew what was going on. And so uh, uh, we kind of were known as uh, restructuring engineers. We, in other words, a fancy name for scroungers. They would go to uh, the scrapyard and they'd get uh, two air conditioning units. One that had a bad compressor in it. He'd take the bad compressor out. The other one had, say, the condenser bad. He'd take the compressor out of that and put it in a good one and make a good one. So uh, we... Uh, we were probably the only hooch, that's what they called the barracks, that we slept in. There were about 14 or 16 guys in double double bunks, and uh, we were probably the only uh, enlisted men in Vietnam that had air, air conditioned hooch. So, uh, but the thing about it, we'd go down to the yard ER there, and they always packed flares in styrofoam. Well, they'd take the flares and the rockets and everything, throw the styrofoam away, and we'd go down and get them and insulate the hooch. So, uh, well, when rockets come in, the, the siren would go off. Well, it was insulated so good, you had to really listen to hear the, hear the sirens go off. So, and uh, I was telling them in the other room that uh, not everybody can say that uh, uh, they went to Vietnam with their brother-in-law and brother. My brother-in-law was my platoon sergeant, and my brother was my supply sergeant. So your brother-in-law was at your sister's husband then? Right. And what was his name? George Keller. 
He was the platoon sergeant. He was an E7. And Dick was an E6, my brother Dick Richard. Were you in the same area? Yes, yes. Yeah, the, the, uh, uh, I think George served about seven months. His, his enlisted time went, expired, so uh, he, he went home early. So, and about three months after that, my brother's time went out too, so. So he went home early. So, and you were left there on your yeah, own, right? Yeah. How, how long did you stay? Altogether? Eleven months. And so uh, we uh, uh, we kind of the last month we got released early. We didn't have a job, so we kind of went to the beach every day. So uh, and. Uh, so you know we, well one thing one thing we're, I will probably not all say it, but uh, we found out we was re released. Uh, we drank uh, a pile of beer in one day, 144 cases. How many guys? Oh, the whole unit, the whole unit. Yeah. So. Tell me a little bit about the day that you found out you were going overseas. Well. I got called up when they had the race riots up in Chicago. I spent three days up there for, for uh, when Martin Luther King got killed, and we uh, we did we stayed in the armory there and didn't didn't do much. I don't know why we went up there, but uh, that's a rough old hall in the back of a deuce and a half all the way to Chicago, sitting on a couple boards. But uh, we got back. And they let the guys that went to Chicago go home and take showers and stuff like that. And we come back. That's when I found out that we got called up. So they gave us gave us a month. Uh, Do you remember the day that you actually traveled? Oh yeah, yeah. What was that like? Well, we we uh, all met over the train station. We went to. Uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, on the train, and uh, we were out there. I think it was around six months, and then uh, we got orders to deploy. So we started uh, loading stuff up into these containers, which are popular now. But back then, they weren't very popular. But uh, uh, we loaded stuff up and, and took it over there. And a couple guys went with the containers on the ship and, and we flew we flew uh, uh, I think it was out of the Air Force in Fort Carson, Colorado Springs so we went, we, I think we flew out of the Air Force still I'm not sure on that but uh, uh, they let us in three, three planes and took us over there so. Do you remember how many guys were in each plane? No, mm, uh, a bunch of us. Yeah, it's probably like a commercial jet. So, I think, I think about 130 was the total number of the guards. I'm not sure on that either. Was that all of the 126? Mm -hmm. We had a couple guys that uh, we had some slots open. A couple guys volunteered. Uh, there was a Sergeant Taylor, uh, he he volunteered. He's from down around in Kentucky somewhere. And so, yeah. the one twenty six was that based here in Quincy? Yes, it was. We're the only unit, the only Illinois guard unit, to get called up for Vietnam. You were telling me earlier that there were some brothers. In yeah, the yeah. We had uh, originally. Uh, 13 sets, I think it was, 12 or 13 sets, and uh, two of the brothers uh, decided not to go, uh, you know, so one of them had to go. So two of the sets didn't go. One of them went to Korea, I know. So then the other one went to Vietnam. And uh, we had one set of three, three brothers, all three of them went. And uh, 
So we had nine nine sets that went to Vietnam together. Yeah. Did you were you close to the combat zone? Where you no, were? we were. We'd get rockets, rockets in once in a while, you know, and uh, but that's that's about that's about it. Um, we had uh, a rocket come in once that uh, uh, hit a 40-foot sailboat, direct hit, blew it up, and they loaded it in the back of the three-quarter ton. They blew it, blew it up, you know. So. Was the sailboat a local sailboat, or? Yeah. It? Well, I see that they had a medical deal there too. I think. Uh, if I remember right, I think uh, there was a nurse killed, and she's the first female that was ever killed in Vietnam. It was in Chu Lai. And she was on the boat? No, right. she was in the vet barracks around there. Oh. So. Did you have it? Did you lose any friends? No, no, we didn't. We uh, we lost a couple uh, people that came in after people left, you know, we lost a couple of regular army or, or draftees. We lost a couple of them, one of them, I guess he was high on dope or something like that and he pulled a pin or a grenade and he was right next to a beer hole. And when you pull a pin on a grenade and you let go of it, you better get rid of it. Well, he let go of it close to there and I just took him and put him on the side of the building. So the next day they hosed him off. So, uh, that's probably when the rocks hit the tin roof and you, you look out the door and you'd say, oh, the rocket direct hit on the beer hall. You know, so. It sounds like you guys were pretty close. All, everybody came from the 126. Oh, yeah, we were tight. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, everybody knew everybody. And, uh, well, uh, when I come back, I met my wife, and both her brothers was one set of the brothers in there too. So you know, and uh, there's guys you went to school with and stuff like that. We had two barbers in the unit, so you didn't have to worry about uh, you didn't have to worry about getting your hair cut. You know, he did. He and he brought a barber's chair from Colorado Springs. They put it in one of the dumpsters, and, and he still got the barber's chair at his, his, his house. And uh, a funny story about that, I just heard that our 45-year reunion was that uh, he bought that out in Colorado Springs, and he told the, the guy he wanted $20 for it. And, uh, and uh, he drew him down to 10 and the guy was with him said, well, what'd you get it for? And he said, uh, Ten dollars, he said. Well, I ain't even gonna help you unload it until you give him twenty for it. So, do you remember the man's name who bought the chair? Yeah, Jim Losher. Oh, really? Yeah. So, were your duties the same over in Vietnam? Yes, I uh, I worked with uh, another guy from the unit, Danny Keck, and. Uh, uh, Regular Army guy, his name was Graham. I can't remember his first name, but I ran across the picture of him not too long ago. So, uh, but uh, in Vietnam, the worst part, first time, first when you first get over there is the heat. It took me three days to get used to the heat. All I wanted to do was sleep. So, were you able to stay in touch with any friends and family back home? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. How'd you do that? Um, mostly letters and uh, cassette tapes. You could go, uh, you got your tape recorder, you could go to the bunker at night and see it be quiet there. You could talk to talk to the tape and then mail it off. Yeah. Was there anybody special you were writing to or recording for back no, then? No, I didn't, I didn't have no sweetheart back then. I, you know, I pretty well played the field back then. I was only 20, 24, so yeah, I was one of the younger ones. And you said some of your comrades helped introduce you to his, your wife, or did you meet her well, on I, your own? 
uh, her younger brother Mike fixed me up with a blind date, but it wasn't with my wife. It uh, was with another gal, and uh, so I had to go out and pick him up so we could go m meet the girls and like that. And my wife was there in curlers and uh, the kid, kids' shoes, you know, toes out of them and everything. You know, she she worked in the garden. Like that. it took me two weeks to find out what her name was because uh, he introduced her. This is my gunky sister. <laughs> So, yeah, but it took me two weeks to find out what her name is. Yeah. We've been married 43 years. Wow. Congratulations. So you told me you went to the beach when you were off duty. Yeah. Did you do any other things for fun? Well, I went to r and R. I went to Sydney, Australia for a week. Oh, what'd you do there? Party. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's... Uh, it was real, real nice. I got to see the opera house and and uh, um, all the Epsom parks and stuff like that. Worst part of it, they drive on the wrong side of the road. He's in the back of the cab. Every time he turned there, he pressing on the brake. Because in in Sydney, they didn't have a speed limit then now. And taxi drivers drove quick. So, did you go by yourself or no I had uh, two other guys in the unit one of them was Kenny Kenny Rakers and the other one Paul Wellman but, uh, that was you? the quickest week in the whole trip you know? I bet <laughs> were you awarded any medals or citations just uh, Vietnam service and work. did you leave before the war was over well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We uh, we had 11, 11 months in the country. So. Uh, do you remember learning that you were going to get to come home? Oh yeah, we we partied. <laughs> you we, said there was some beer involved. Well, see, being a quartermaster, you had uh, access to so much uh, so much stuff, you know, like. Uh, a guy, uh, company needed some water. You know, you fill up your tanker, and you take it there, and you say, "What are you going to give me?" You know, and so you get a fifth of whiskey. And whisk, you know, a fifth was uh, uh, just like cash. You know, so and uh, so that uh, uh, shoes and stuff like that. The whole time I was there, I didn't polish boot one. My boots get looking a little rough. I just catch them and get a new pair. You know, so. You were the guy to know. Huh? Yeah. Well, no. It's, see, uh, uh, quartermaster, you you issue gas, water, food, clothing, and all that. So you had all that. To, that's why we built uh, our beer hall. That uh, um, we had pl access to the plywood and. Stuff like that. So, that's one of the stories I just remembered talking about the plywood. I was working nights and I was driving a tow motor and I picked up a, a 144 2x4s, 10 foot long, like that. And I picked them up and there were tracers going across, across the sky, like that. And I was watching, I had my lever on there. I dumped all 140. Oh, was, so the rest of the night I was picking up two by fours. So. Do you have any other memories that stand out from your time in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, but I don't know if you want to hear this, but I'll tell you anyway. Yeah, we uh, took stuff to the dump. Well, if you take stuff to the dump over there, you put all your wood and stuff on the bottom. Then you put all your trash on on the top. Well, you go to the dump and you back it in. All these Vietnamese would climb over the truck like ants. Well, they see that wood on the bottom, they'd throw everything off so you wouldn't have to unload the truck. So, yeah, very, very filthy people.
Yeah. Is there anything else that stands out? No. Tell me a little bit about the day you went home. Well, they flew us out of Chulai. Where we, when we flew in, we flew in in Da Nang, and then we got uh, down. They got us down to Chulai, and uh, but we flew, flew commercial on the way home. And that, when that when that plane took off, everybody was yelling, but she didn't say nothing until the plane took off. So yeah. Were there a lot of other men from your unit coming the back? The whole unit. We got. And we got, uh, we flew from uh, July to Anchorage, Alaska, and from Anchorage, Alaska to, I think it's Whit Whitland Air Force Base down uh, by Leonard Wood. <coughs> Excuse me, but uh, then they truck they bust us from there over to Leonard Wood. We spent a week down there because they wanted to have a parade for us there. So most of us came home. We, I come home in a U-Haul truck. <laughs> guy, guy ran out of the U-Haul truck and, and uh, we was in the back. So, so you just paid paid uh, like like you had a bus, you know. So, but, uh, so did you stay for the parade? Well, we were in it, you yeah. Were? Yeah, what yeah they that? had... Uh, uh, convertibles. They had like two, two of the guys in, in one convertible. Yeah. And that was down at Fort Leonard Wood. No, that oh, was here. That was here. Okay. Yeah, yeah that was here in Quincy. Yeah. Everybody was excited to see you home. Yeah. Yeah. How was your readjustment when you got back? Did you pick up where you left off? Yeah, I, they were kind of anxious to get me back on the road, I think. And, uh, yeah, I think I was two weeks and I was back to work. Yeah. At the job you had before? Yeah. Have you re remained in contact with a lot of folks? Oh, yeah. We have, uh, we just had our 45 year reunion and there was, uh, About 80, I think, 80 back. We've lost 30, 34. And uh, there were about 80 back. There's a few that that uh, are not in good health. But, uh, uh, yeah, they, we should pretty well say, when we get together other, every other month for uh, the guys go out and eat. So we get together every other month, which is, we get, Oh, on average, probably 30, 30 a time. So, uh -oh. are most of the guys still local? No, we get them from. Uh, uh, there's five or six of them from Perry, Illinois, which is out around Pittsfield, Pike County, and uh, there's uh, my bunk mate. Uh, that I had uh, just after we got over there. He's in Cincinnati, and uh, they're all over. We got one in Rich Richmond, Virginia, and so they're they're all over. So, but uh, no, we was real happy with the turnout of it. So, so you you get together every month every other month for dinner, and then but you recently had a big reunion. Is yeah, that yeah, that. Uh, I think it was September when we had it, yeah. And how often do you do those? Uh, about every five years, maybe. It's a lot of work. So, yeah. How do you keep in touch? Is it mostly phone calls? or? Well, they email a lot. Uh, Ron Coogan, which was in the first platoon, uh, he pretty well does all the email and stuff. And, uh, Was there anything special you took over with you? Like a good luck item or? No. Nah. Did you like the food over there? If you like roast beef, it was all right. 
they got they got a book over there. I think it's uh, ten thousand ways to fix roast beef. Uh, well, uh, my brother and me, we didn't have too much roast beef when I come home for a while. You know, it just kind of burned you out. So, but like I said, we were we learned dealers. You you do something for somebody, and they well, get a case of steaks. We'd have we'd have made our own grills, and that would grill out and we'd have to have steak so uh, it was just like job was just like working a job here you know but uh, a lot of dust rain you haven't seen rain until you went through a monsoon it rained and rain and you'd have rain suits but it was so darn hot you might as well not even use them because you're just as wet inside as what it's holding off. So. Have you used any uh, military benefits? Yes, I, uh, I've i been to uh, Iowa City and I found out I was diabetic. So uh, I'm taking uh, one pill in the morning and one pill in the afternoon. So, so the VA helps with yeah. that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think the military experience affected you, affected your life? It made me grow up. Yeah, I was timid when I went over there, but, you know, yeah, it, it make you grow up. I think they ought to reinstate the draft for me because that would make a, a lot of these kids nowadays that have no respect, they'd learn it in basic. Has your military service impacted your feelings about the war or military in general? No, but it's affected me as far as being a veteran and and uh, what uh, the veteran benefits and stuff like that. That I mean, they, they might say it's all free, but you you know the guys earned it. Mm -hmm. Is there any message you'd like to leave for future generations who may hear or read this interview? No. Is there anything else that I haven't asked you about you'd like to talk about? No. No? All right. Well, then, I will thank you for your time. It was yeah. very nice to meet you.